on this edition of Sightings, a frightening entity leaves a bloody trail. Sally, stop it. On tape, it's a stunning paranormal event. She scares the living daylights out of me. Then, from America's UFO hotspot, evidence of an extraterrestrial invasion. We've seen an extraordinary increase in large-scale contact events. And this man's gift is haunted by the faces of death. I bring life to death through my artistic abilities. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. A ghostly presence on videotape. It's the one piece of hard evidence that's eluded our ghost investigations. Until now. When Sightings received a call from a beleaguered family in the Midwest, our team went to investigate. What they found was haunting activity unlike anything this Sightings crew had ever seen. The result was hours of bizarre ghostly activity captured for the first time on videotape. It's happening here, somewhere in America's heartland. The family has asked that we not say exactly where they live, but it's a town like any other where people work, raise a family, and are laid to rest. There, however, the similarity ends. We were told at least one soul here is not at rest, and that her spirit is trapped inside this house. Spirit, ghost, entity. It has many names, and many ways of making its presence known. The family here fears ridicule and persecution. They've asked us not to use their real names, so we'll refer to them as Pamela, Jeff, and their infant son, Donnie. The first signs of something out of the ordinary began when the young couple moved into this 128-year-old house in January of 1993. At first, the haunting activity was subtle and only seemed to be occurring in one small bedroom at the top of the stairs. Pamela and Jeff had a weird, indefinable feeling that something wasn't quite right. Their usually docile dog started feeling it too. She would whimper and cry any time she came near that room. They now feel the persistent barking was a warning they did not heed. As these home videos show, after the birth of their son, Donnie, the bedroom was converted into a nursery. It was here that an entity began to show itself. Pictures of newborn Donnie were marred by strange blocks of free-floating light and shadow. It happened on roll after roll of film and with two different cameras. Even more bizarre was the discovery, when this photo was enlarged, that the crayon on the tablet seems to be held in space by an invisible hand. We tried to recreate this photo with wires, pins, and other tricks. We could not. Through a friend, Pamela contacted psychic Barbara Connor, who believes she can communicate with entities from the past. I was thinking it was a little crowded. Yeah, she doesn't like it. She says, too many people are in here, get out. Within a few minutes of her arrival, Barbara began to communicate with what she felt was the spirit of a child. She said the spirit was that of a little girl named Sally and that she was there to protect the baby Donnie. Barbara believes that the blurs and streaks in dozens of family photographs are actually a physical manifestation of Sally. We wanted Edson Williams, a trick photography expert, to give us his opinion. Sightings obtained the original negatives and photos, and with the family's approval, had them analyzed to determine if anything in the camera or in the film processing could account for the bizarre images. One photo that I really caught my attention was the Christmas photos. The, the highlights that ran through the image, they're localized, they're not throughout the image, they're in very small regions, and they're running at different angles. I, initially, I tried to recreate this simply with a, a few quick tricks, and unfortunately, they did not work for me. It would be a very difficult shot to recreate. Another photograph I found very interesting was one I had a small child's toy in a corner with a, a blue ghosting image around it. Uh, initially, I thought it possibly it cut out a blue gel, which would be a, a blue plastic, clear plastic, and a wiggle that in front of the camera could recreate it. But the density differences were too varied. Photographic evidence is something I always question because 
My job is to create illusions photographically. But these several pictures that I was shown are very difficult to explain. The family believes this is evidence of Sally, the lost spirit of a long dead girl. And like a macabre version of Mother Goose, when Sally is good, she's very, very good. And when she's bad, she's horrid. According to Pamela and Jeff, this is Sally's handiwork. They say a swirling, frigid aura announces her presence. Then Sally leaves welting, bloody slashes on Jeff's bare flesh, as documented in these photos and verified by many eyewitnesses. So far, Jeff has been the only victim. When our sightings crew arrived to investigate, the first step was to videotape interviews with Pamela and Jeff. These interviews were important, but the director had given strict orders to immediately turn the cameras on any strange activity as soon as it occurred. It was during this first interview session that the entity made its presence known. Jeff and Donnie watched from just behind the camera as Pamela was being interviewed first. We had gone over to my in-laws. We had come home. Um, shortly afterwards, we found all the stuffed animals that were in As Pamela areas. described a previous encounter with Sally, noise from a backyard chainsaw started to interfere with the videotaping. The were closed. The cats were downstairs with us. Um, just nothing natural could happen. As Pamela waited for the noise to stop, Jeff called out. Is it, is it going? She don't like everybody here, did <laughs> Sally, stop it. What? How did that happen? You don't know. I, I, I... Sally? Go on and walk in there. Walk in there. And, and get a towel and clean it off his arm. Stay on the... What's going on? Uh, I gotta get my sense of it. She's right here, because it is freezing right here. It is freezing. I feel it. All you do is you feel this cold go through you. That's how I just Sally? Look back. Okay, Sally, it. we're gonna stop. Us? Sally, we're gonna stop until Barbara comes here, okay? When Barbara comes, she'll, cool she'll right talk here. to you and let you know. Right here. Uh -huh. I can feel it. We're, we're interviewing. It's hot. We've turned the air conditioner off for sound purposes, but it is cold right here in this part of the room. And the air conditioner is off. Mm hmm I just felt Look at that. The cold Look at that. Like freeze me over here. This is the same thing that occurs when Holy she's scratched his face. Holy or he's had scratches across his forehead or down huh. his arm. She does this when she's upset. I'm still shaking. <laughs> I know, my heart's pounding too. I think I'm a little excited. I gotta tell you. Hey. Well, we've had a little excitement this morning. Oh really? Already? Yeah. The family asked psychic Barbara Connor to join our investigation. They felt Barbara could communicate with Sally and help calm her down. Feeling good? <laughs> What's this? That's what she just did. She just did this? Yeah. I feel her now. Yeah, she's here. Hi, Sally. What's going on? Excitement. <laughs> she's excited. It's really cold. Okay, okay, it's okay. Yeah, it's, uh, she's excited about all this. Is she yeah. liking it, or yeah. is she upset? She's upset. She's a little upset. Um, what's going on here? She says, I like it, but it's scary. Yeah, well, honey, it's scary for us, too. Yeah, We've that's never what done I, anything like this. That's what I told her. I said, I said, no, it's everybody's uptight with this. I, she scares the living daylights out of me, to be honest with you. I, I'm can add this right now. She's right here with me right now. <laughs> I'm feeling something really cold shoot around my stomach. Um, we asked Jeff to describe what he was feeling. He looked like he was in pain, but Jeff didn't respond. For a moment, he couldn't speak. <sighs> I've lost my breath. I'm sorry. Today, in the chair, as you guys were interviewing my wife, I was sitting in the rocking chair with my son. He was playing with a little toy, and we were tilted a little forward so we could watch the interview through the doorway. When this cold just shot through my arm, and it's done it before, I knew the feeling. It's just, I can't explain the cold. It's, it freezes your bones, everything. And as I looked towards my arm, I had four scratches that were bleeding as I looked at him, and it's really frightening. Yeah. 
She's just went right through my midsection. I don't... Oh, my God, look. Look. I... Oh, look, they're forming. Can't come up with an explanation why she does this. Look, it's forming right there. She tends to do this to me because I upset her sometimes. I And she wants to be noticed, I think, today. <laughs> this family has asked to remain anonymous. Uh, what's happening inside their house is so bizarre, they don't want to become just another media event. When we return, our investigation continues. Coming up next on Sightings. And this is like the most profound thing I've ever seen in all parapsychology. This is fact, and you have it on tape. In the years we've been doing this program, our ghost investigations have been time-consuming and often frustrating. But the current case in the Midwest is clearly different. From day one, the crew was experiencing unexplainable haunting phenomena. And they were getting it on tape. It's a sensation like uh, the air conditioning on your automobile. If you put your hand up right in front of the vent, you feel the Real air blowing. Real fresh. Real fresh. Cold. But if you move yeah. your hand away from the vent, it goes away. Oh. Oh, boy. That was... I think she's it's, messing with you. It is swirling. Our sightings director is Greg Cook. Is he was excited about the presence of strange cold spots that would come and go without warning or reason. It is so cold right here. Oh, this is this electrical charge you're talking about? Did you feel it? Did you feel it? <laughs> yeah. It's like... It's like a, mi a mild electrical mild. shock. Yeah. Right there. Ooh, my God. Can you feel it? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Electrical shock. Right here. That is unbelievable. Just... Paranormal investigator Howard Heim brought in instruments that could measure the cold and magnetic energy everyone in the house was feeling. Howard Heim has documented over 100 reported hauntings throughout the world. Strangely enough, as soon as he arrived, our video camera began to malfunction. There was breakup, usually a sign that there's been some kind of electrical interference. Can you feel this? Come here. No, I cannot. As soon as you came over, it went this way. You can feel it? Well, let's take a few minutes. It's 77.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit in here. This dropped a point. It did instantly drop point then, then from, go, from point seven to just, point just, six. Just there. No, wait right there. It just dropped another point. It's dropping again. Point four. It dropped again. It's point three now. And I gradually and it dropped a point again. It's now point two. It keeps getting cooler in this room. It's like a narrow shaft of yeah. cool air. Mm -hmm. It is. And my hand is, I can feel it coming down, but his hand's on top of mine. And if you put yours underneath, you should be able to feel it as well, even yeah. though... Ooh, I actually feel, feel it slightly it, feel, cooler. Feel that? Yeah. Blowing around? Yeah. I actually feel like a small uh, circumference of about uh, four inches in diameter coming straight down. And our hands are blocking the airflow. Mm -hmm. hmm. That was interesting. It was almost like a narrow thing it's hitting the back of my hand. The instruments picked up both an increase in electromagnetism and a measurable decrease in room temperature. But no instrument could explain what happened just a few minutes later in the kitchen. Pamela was showing Barbara a teddy bear that had been inexplicably burned. Later, in the same spot, Sally seemed to be telling Pamela she was the fire starter. My husband found this kind of half fresh, half dead flower singed around the edges. Is it possible that Sally burned the rose in reaction to Pamela's discussion about the teddy bear? We went back to that earlier moment on our raw field tapes. The rose was there on the windowsill, but at this point it appeared fully red with undamaged petals. Who could have burned that rose without anyone seeing it or smelling it in the space of less than five minutes? That's incredible. The interior leaves are burnt around the edges with no damage to the overlapping leaves, as if they were individually burned and then assembled. Mm. That is bizarre. You can't, you can't duplicate this. 
this cannot be done. Okay. Well, let's uh, go see. Show me where she lives, <laughs> so to speak, here. And uh, um, this yeah. used to be this cradle, but we've put it in here as like a gathering for her toys, things that she's allowed to play with and not get into trouble for. In the bedroom that had been the source of so much haunting activity, electromagnetic field readings were normal at first. Then Pamela felt that Sally had arrived. Oh, man. Yeah. Right here. The magnetometer needle jumped. Look at it. We're two and a half. Now we're at three. three. I can actually feel it between my fingers. It's very light, but it is noticeable. It's still me. During our investigation, Everyone who entered the house felt an eerie, ghostly presence. But only Jeff claims to have actually seen a manifestation of Sally. I walked over to the kitchen cabinet, opened the cabinet and got out a glass, poured more orange juice. Started to take a drink, and as I turned around, there was a little girl standing not more than three foot away from me, just as plain as you are to me now. Just standing there with this plain look on her face, just looking at me like, she was curious about me too and it oh i can't explain the, <laughs> the feeling i got i dropped the glass the glass shattered and as i dropped the glass she was gone just as quick as she was there it was just gone sally never materialized for our low light intensity viewing equipment but our normal video camera did pick up perhaps the most stunning paranormal event ever recorded on tape. It came without warning as our cameras were in the process of recording one final scene. Sally, can you see through it? Is it working? Yeah. And, and go up. On top. Very slowly, yeah. Same j Look, one's starting to bleed. There's a whole new... Oh, look, look at that. Look oh at God. that. Oh, look at that. Oh, my God. It actually... I knew just, she was around. <laughs> it's this nice dark one where look. it's bleeding. <laughs> look, look at that. Look at, the look at that. It. It's standing on down. Look there at it is. Bottom. Look at it. We trained our cameras on Jeff's torso for nine minutes, the entire duration of the bizarre event. What first appeared as scratches eventually grew into long, thick, bleeding welts. No one had a logical explanation. Scratched, to be honest with you. It just simply appeared. You lifted your shirt, the same scratches were there. You put this to your stomach, and all of a sudden blood started to ooze out. And this is like the most profound thing I've ever seen in all parapsychology. I've seen and felt a few things myself, but it could be suggestion. But the, this is not suggestion at all. This is fact, and you have it on tape. When our crew returned from the Midwest, the excitement in the sightings offices was palpable. Our videotape has become the object of intense interest for paranormal investigators like Kerry Gaynor. We ask him to view the tape, making careful examination yeah, in side-by-side -side views of the before and after frames taken while this bleeding scratch welted up before our camera. When we return, I'll be joined by field director Greg Cook and world-renowned parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor as we continue this remarkable investigation. Coming up next, historic contact with an entity. And later, from America's UFO hotspot, unprecedented daylight sightings captured on tape. Joining me now is sightings director Greg Cook. Greg supervised the crew on site during our investigation. Greg, you've earned your stripes in the news business for a long time. You've worked for 60 Minutes and elsewhere. Has anything like this ever happened before? Never, Tim. Uh, the frightening thing was that it happened early in the day at 10 o'clock in the morning with all of the movie lights on and all the people through the house. It wasn't like what you would presume you see when you see a ghost. It didn't happen late at night under candlelight and that sort of thing. It was in the confusion of the crew arriving mm -hmm. and uh, in daylight hours and everybody felt it. It was, it was, that was the frightening thing. You actually felt this thing happen. Everybody in the crew did. We saw the, uh, we saw the rows and we saw the marks on the man's body. There was another incident that you didn't have yeah. the bib? There was a shot that I thought might be interesting if she were to walk in carrying the baby and the baby at the time was sitting in the high chair. So I said, let's just, you know, move to this area of the mm -hmm. room, walk in and we'll begin. She took off the baby's bib 
took 10 steps mm -hmm. to the left and walked back in again and went to put the bib on it would not attach the the plastic cap mm -hmm. beneath the bib had burned in the 20 seconds it took for her to walk away from the bib i immediately smelled it mm -hmm. and could could smell a, a sense of charcoal and burning but the plastic had melted but there was no fire damage to the top or bottom of that piece of plastic and that occurred right while we were there and it was a sort of a frightening moment that, that did occur at night and uh, i felt a little uneasy about staying well, there you're a skeptical guy uh, yeah. couldn't all of this have been faked somehow no, no if we'd gone there and perhaps what you saw was was cutting and bleeding you might question how did that happen the fact was that everybody who came Film members, other friends of theirs, neighbors mm -hmm. who had been there for the time of the taping, everybody in the room felt the same sensation of cold. I think there's a lot of interpretation there. Mm -hmm. But I do know that what I felt and what everybody else in our crew felt was uh, a definite electrical energy. Mm -hmm. It moved around the room. You could follow it around the room. It wasn't something that we just kind of said, well, we thought it was there. It was there. Well, Greg, since you filed this report, Sightings has contacted parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor and asked for his insight. Mr. Gaynor is best known for his investigations of the now famous entity and poltergeist cases. Mr. Gaynor, you've had a chance to look at our field videotapes. What do you think? Well, I think it's very exciting. The, the nice thing for me as a researcher is that the cameraman held the camera on the blood spot from the moment it started to the moment the welts appeared. He never cut away. So we have about eight or nine minutes of raw footage, which I have examined. And it's very interesting. It's very exciting. I spent a great deal of time trying to determine which cases are worth investigating and which are not. And I think this one is. What are some of the more common signs of a haunting? Things that show up here as well as other cases you've looked into? Well, one of the things I was intrigued by were the, the bears that were found in the middle of the room. And they went out of the room and they put the bears back. They came back and one bear was found in the middle of the room. This like poltergeist? That's right. This suggests a very playful kind of experience. And we come across this a lot. People take their clothes out. They get up the next morning. They're back in the drawer again. Just playful type phenomena. You think this family is at threat, in danger? Well, I think there are different types of things going on in this house. I wouldn't want to think... I wouldn't think there's one explanation. The, the, the bears appearing in the middle of the room is a, is a playful type poltergeist experience. But the scratches on the man's stomach and his arm, and uh, according to his testimony, he was yanked out of his bed. Those are pretty terrifying experiences. And yes, I, I'm a little concerned about that. We'll continue to look into it. Parapsychologist Kerry Gaynor, thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. And I will be going back to the Midwest along with Greg Cook and our entire investigative team to see what more we can learn about the Heartland Ghost. We'll bring you our findings as soon as possible. When sightings continues, at all costs, preserve the social order. That has always been the stakes. Those are war stakes, okay? Then, sculpting the faces of death. And later, is this the portal to a parallel universe? 90% of all reported UFOs are seen after dark. Far rarer and virtually undocumented are daytime sightings. But now a rash of daylight UFO sightings is being meticulously documented in one of the world's most famous UFO hotspots, Gulf Breeze, Florida. Since at least 1947, elements of our government have been absolutely aware that we have non-human, highly advanced intelligence visiting this planet. If the secret is impossible to keep, then we must find a way to adjust to this extraordinary oddity. Bottom line is, at all costs, preserve the social order. That has always been the stakes. And of course, those are very high stakes. Those are war stakes, okay? We're, we're looking at a war here. They won't go away. The latest Gulf Breeze sightings are adding an ominous new layer to the UFO story. Sightings has obtained exclusive photographs and videotapes of mysterious craft flying in broad daylight. This new evidence is among the most significant UFO footage ever recorded. The photo and video evidence that we've recently seen from Gulf Breeze is far more important than the, all the previous UFO photo and video evidence combined. It used to be just another resort town in southern Florida. But Gulf Breeze has changed. Vacationing families drawn to the area's tropical waters and white sand beaches aren't the only visitors in the area. For nearly a decade, the name Gulf Breeze has become synonymous with UFOs. 
It's been going on almost continuously since 1987. It is not a flash in the pan situation. The clusters of sightings over Gulf Breeze are taking on a new look. Rare daylight events have UFO researchers scrambling for an explanation. We now are going through a series, it seems, of daylight sightings, and the nighttime sightings have uh, almost completely uh, diminished. 90% of all reported or recorded UFO sightings occur at night. Only 10% are seen during daytime hours and are rarely captured on tape or film. Along with the increase in daylight sightings has been an increase in the number of eyewitness reports. The people in the community who have said that they've seen UFOs are people like doctors and lawyers and, and real estate people. And it's just not a bunch of lunatics from running around saying that they saw lights in the sky. It's, it's uh, very different. This is not a movie. It is actual footage of a UFO seen over Gulf Breeze in broad daylight. The daylight sightings that we've had of the last year have all been authenticated. The, the photographs, the videos, the witnesses have all proved positive. Here in Gulf Breeze, there are so many sightings and there's so much going on. Either you have to go on with your life or you let it just drive you crazy. And so I've just chose to go on with my life. On November 28, 1993, Ed Walters, a successful local contractor, saw bright flashes of light in the afternoon sky. He grabbed his home video camera and drove toward the lights. I actually drove down to the uh, public beach, um, got out of my truck and uh, calmly uh, walked out onto the beach, uh, hoping that I might uh, see these bright flashes once again. Walking along here towards the west. Continued to scan around, look around. Uh, Panning around here. 360, there's the sand dunes, that's the north. Oh, jeez, goodness gracious. Over those dunes right there. It appeared and flew in from the north, hovered out over the beach, over the shoreline and uh, I dashed over to the, towards the sand dunes and dropped to my knees and uh, started filming it. This is what Ed Walters captured on videotape. The shaded, disc-shaped object appears to hover overhead, then abruptly disappears. There she is, right there. Oh my God, just hovering right there. Oh, 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 oh Jesus, when you know it. Jeff Senyo is a video analyst with MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. Recognized worldwide as an expert in his field, Senio believes Walter's tape is authentic. Notice particularly when he sees the object, how the oscilloscope shows that the camera was indeed bounced around. You'll see a lot of video disturbance there, which is typical of a raw video of a camera that's been bounced around. That eliminates editing as a possibility for creating this thing. There she is, right there. Ed Walters is no stranger to UFO documentation. He snapped the first Gulf Breeze UFO photograph in 1987. He also took this picture, which he believes is a near miss between a UFO and a fighter jet. And the jet had, was continuing on and passed right, looked to me like it was headed right at the UFO. Ed Walters has come under fire from skeptics who do not believe that one man could have seen and documented so many significant UFO events. But Walters is not bothered by charges that he is a sophisticated hoaxer. There are some people who just absolutely will not consider the evidence. They will, uh, they will kill the messenger. Judge me if you will, but the fact is I've videotaped and saw a UFO. With enough time, money, luck, and skill, anything can be faked. But unless Ed Walters has Steven Spielberg as a brother-in-law to fake this video, two different types of photographs, would be extremely difficult for an ordinary man to fake. Walters isn't the only one to document a daytime sighting. This footage was shot by a Gulf Breeze resident who chooses to remain anonymous. He gave the tape and his story to local reporter Bland Pugh. The UFO, as he observed it, came out of the southeast. It moved over his head at an incredibly fast speed and disappeared out to the northwest. This particular sighting in itself 
was a landmark sighting in that it actually showed the UFO disappearing or leaving, as it were. See it coming in here, it's very indistinct. It appears to be moving relatively slowly. So here's a slowdown of the same video, object hovering there motionless and zips off instantaneously, barely make it out as it zips off to the right. The object was about three miles away on the left side, got up to about two miles away on the right side, and was doing about 4,000 miles an hour. Still another documented sighting comes from an eyewitness known only as Philip. The flight pattern is similar to that on the other videotapes, and so is the shape of the craft. The, the various videos corroborate each other. They corroborate previous witness testimony. And so it all, the, the pieces of the puzzle all fit together. Military bases in the area may have information about what is flying above southern Florida. But every attempt to obtain comment from the military is not only denied, it is ignored. It could be that the military is tied into this. I'm not accusing, nor am I saying they are covering up. I'm just saying that they have, they've just kept their mouth shut. I do believe there is a growing pattern of contact which suggests that we are getting closer to actually meeting the neighbors. Gulf Breeze is part of that pattern. We will be back with more sightings in just a moment. Next on Sightings. The recomposer of the decomposed. And it's not a bad title. He does recompose people. It comes right from my soul. Forensic scientists go to great lengths to try and identify the skeletal remains of anonymous victims in our nation's morgues. One technique involves taking an unidentified skull and building a face on top of it with clay. The clay is applied according to scientific measurements based on anatomy. But one of the most successful forensic sculptors doesn't rely on science alone. Nobody should be dead without a name. I mean, that to me is a disgrace to a society that does nothing about getting these people identified. These are the faces of death brought to life by sculptor Frank Bender. I bring life to death through my artistic abilities. The artist takes anonymous numbered remains and gives them a human face. But Bender says he does more than recreate flesh. He tries to capture their souls so they can reach out to a long lost loved one. It was almost like a spiritual thing. When you looked at her, I mean, it just, the face just appeared. He starts with a nameless, faceless skull. In his mind's eye, a picture starts to form. Using an artist's intuition, a detective's hunch, and some say a psychic gift, Bender creates a person out of clay and paint. He calls himself the recomposer of the decomposed. And that's not a bad title, really. He does recompose people. Frank Bender has given sightings a rare opportunity to observe him at work in his studio. He's trying to help police identify the killer of a five-year-old boy found dead near a vacant lot in Philadelphia. The key to this investigation is actually finding out who the child is. And this is where Frank comes in. Frank Bender's bizarre forensic career began in a morgue in 1976. He was a struggling artist looking to study anatomy. In a moment that changed his life forever, Bender was strangely drawn to one badly decomposed Jane Doe. We really didn't have any idea what she looked like, and we didn't have a very good clue into who she really was. I had said to the technician, well, I know what she looks like. With instinct and intuition as his only guides, Bender attempted to discover the woman from just her bare bones. It comes right from my soul, right from my heart. It's not, to me, just an identification thing, not just eyes, nose, and mouth but a personality. His bust was photographed and circulated. Within six months, the victim was identified. There are forensic sculptors working for police departments around the country, but their extensive knowledge of anatomy and the mechanics of physiology lack what Bender brings to the same work, a real sense of who the person was. It was a bittersweet success. Bender was haunted by the faces of his victims. His own personal art began to change. He calls it his nightmare art. It's actually more of a torturous process doing this art. 
It's like the garbage coming out of the experiences of working with these forensic cases. After Bender's initial success, skeptical officials in Philadelphia started to sit up and take notice. His success rate in identifying victims eventually reached 85%. Interpol and the FBI asked for his help. In one case, he was asked to age John List, a man who had killed his entire family and had been on the run for 23 years. In a sense, I sort of become the fugitive, feeling uh, what he felt and trying to imagine what it would be like living this lifestyle that he lived. Bender's bust of an aging John List was broadcast nationwide. List was captured 11 days later. Bender believes that finding the soul within his subjects is the key to his unprecedented success. And in 1990, one soul called out to him more clearly than the rest. Rosella Atkinson had disappeared without a trace. No one found her for three years. It's like you're living on the edge wondering, you know, where is she or if something happened to her. And once you find out something happened to her, you're walking around and you're still looking like you don't believe it. At the same time, Bender was transforming the unidentified skull of a teenage murder victim. I feel that I could feel some of the feelings that were going through her uh, during her life. When I was working on her, I actually felt trapped. In a sense, I guess, like looked up myself and said, she's got to like want a better life than this. Bender felt a hopefulness within the 18-year-old and instinctively sculpted her face pointing upwards. This was the face Rosella's mother saw at a museum exhibit. We went in there and we looked. And we looked and it, it became, I don't know, her, her face, all of a sudden I just seen her in it and I realized it was her. The pose Frank Bender chose was remarkably similar to the pose Rosella struck in her last family portrait. This was how Rosella's mother learned she'd been murdered. I had a picture of almost the same pose he gave her. It would have to be something spiritual to do that. I mean, people can't just come up with uh, something like that. You got to be gifted. I mean, uh, spiritually gifted. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Continue doing your work. I will. I felt really good. I felt like my work had served the purpose. She now had a name and could be buried with dignity. She's at peace and now we can pick up the pieces and go forward. Bender has the same hopes for the remains of a young child whose decomposing corpse was found near a vacant lot. He worked night and day for a week trying to connect with the emotions and personality of the five-year-old victim. This may be the best way of finding the child's killer. As soon as the bust was completed, Philadelphia police put a photograph of it out on the street. This here puts a face to our victim. It makes a person out of them, rather than just a, you know, a pile of bones. We need to identify the child before we can find out who killed him. Look at this boy's face. Look how warm, tender, loving he was. And how many adults would love to have a child like this? Right now, this is all he is, a number. While Frank Bender waits for someone to come forward, he returns to the disturbing world of his nightmare art. It's an outlet for the pain and anguish he feels he must absorb in order to put a human face on death. The last time the Philadelphia morgue had an unidentified child was in the 1950s. Frank Bender's sculpture is just one of the extraordinary measures authorities have taken to try to put a name to this young murder victim. If you have any information about this little boy, believed to be five years old at the time of his death in 1994, please call the Homicide Division of the Philadelphia Police Department. Police are also seeking the killer of Rosella Atkinson. If you have any information, the Philadelphia Police want to hear from you. When sightings returns. A black hole represents the most extreme possible warping of space and time. Is this a portal to a parallel universe? If asked about the possibility of alien visitation on this planet, skeptics might argue that logistically it's just impossible. The universe is so vast 
that even if life did exist in a distant galaxy, it would take billions of years for them to reach us. Ufologists, on the other hand, maintain that there must be a cosmic shortcut. And some suggest that shortcut is through a black hole. A black hole actually may be the entrance to a tunnel from one universe to another, what they call wormholes, worming through or, or, or wriggling your way through from one universe to another. So it's, so it's possible that if we ever do learn how to control and use black holes, it might be possible for us to move into other universes or into other space-time realms that we can't even imagine today. The concept of a cosmic gateway, what scientists today call black holes, was first suggested by Einstein as part of his theory of relativity. He basically said that gravity is the curving of space and time. It's a very hard concept to grasp, very esoteric, but a very fundamental one because it launched modern cosmology, the discovery, the, the, the study of the evolution of the universe and how bodies interact gravitationally. Until the Hubble telescope, black holes were just a theory on paper. Now, many scientists agree that these pictures prove their existence. But how can these bright images be called black holes? Black holes tend to accumulate matter around them. They suck matter off a, a companion star or other material that's in their neighborhood. And this stuff is kind of going around in a whirlpool before it falls down into the hole. And the material gets accelerated so to such a high velocity that it gives off radiation that we can see x-rays and gamma rays or sometimes even visible radiation. Where do black holes come from? A general theory suggests that a collapsing star can become so compressed it virtually punches a hole in the universe. If this is true, then not only is matter compressed, but so is time. A black hole represents the most extreme possible warping of space and time. So the measurement or the observation of time inside and outside the hole are radically different. A person falling into the hole would experience maybe 10 minutes going by, while somebody on the outside would see thousands of years or, in effect, an eternity go by while watching the other person fall in. Any spacecraft entering a black hole today would be ripped apart atom by atom. But if we can find a way in, it may open the door to time travel or even a parallel galaxy. We may be starting to see ways of traveling in time or in space that are impossible now. A black hole really tests the limits of our current understanding about the nature of space and time in the cosmos. The black hole captured by the Hubble telescope is in a distant galaxy called M87. M87 is 50 million light years from Earth. Traveling there in one of our spacecraft would be the equivalent of simply circling the globe 392 billion times. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-933-SIGHT. That's 1-900-933-7444. Each call 65 cents a minute. Average call lasts three minutes. Sightings is also online. Our email address is sightings at aol.com. Next week on Sightings, Tim White encounters the Heartland Ghost. Oh, man. That's weird. Oh, well, now that's very interesting. You'd be okay if I sit down. Then, these women share a terrifying memory of alien abduction and schoolmates saved from certain death by life-saving angels. Absolutely no way that we could have made it through that without some kind of help. Until next time, remember, no mystery is closed to an open mind. For Sightings, I'm Tim White. Next on Sci-Fi, Dark Shadows. Tonight on the next episode of Sci-Fi's Farscape. I think Stark's mask might have shot us sometime into the past. If we change anything here, the future might not happen at this minute. The cold is bloodthirsty and almost impossible to control. Okay, let's get the front out of here. Continues. Sci Fi's Farscape. Tonight at 8. Only on Sci Fi.